Hello and welcome to another interview here on Coin Bureau. Now, today we've got a very special guest joining us in studio. We've got Mr. Yat Siu, who is the executive chairman and executive chairman and founder of Animoca Brands, which is probably one of the most prolific Web3 investors. And of course, he's also a veritable font of knowledge from everything from crypto and much more beyond. So Yat, welcome to Coin Bureau HQ. Thank you so much for the invite. It's wonderful to be here. And, you know, you probably expressed my name best from anyone so far. So thank you so much. For <laughs> now, that. I wanted to make sure there was no confusion between Siu and Sui, the yes, blockchain. Exactly. Some people actually think that Yat is involved in Sui just because his name is, and they don't even realize that the, the letters are spelled is different, exactly. Is exactly different right? <laughs> so I wanted to get that perfectly spot on. So, yes. so yeah, thank you again for being here and welcome to Dubai. Um, and we've obviously got a lot of things to talk about today. Mm. Like I say, a veritable font of knowledge. Um, but I think uh, to lay things out forward for our viewers yes. first, um, do you want to just give us a background in terms of what exactly is Animoca Brands mm. and what informs your investing strategy? So Animoca Brands is actually, interestingly enough, not really a VC in the traditional sense because we don't have a fund. We invest out of our balance sheet. We're actually an operating business known for making games originally, but now much more than that. And our mission is to deliver digital property rights really to the world. That's kind of our broad mission. And we believe obviously tokenization is a way to do that. And that's why Web3 and blockchain technology is so core to what we do. But in order to grow that, we had to basically invest broadly in the space. And we think of that essentially, when you think about tokens, we think of them as representations of network effects. And how do we do that? Basically, we can't just build everything ourselves. We have to sort of basically facilitate others to build these networks and then essentially find a way to co-join the benefits of these uh, shared network effects. And so the investing strategy becomes part of that. In fact, I think you can succeed in Web3 without actually being an investor of some sort, which is very different from the traditional mm -hmm. world, right? In the traditional finance world, you can be a big operator, like for instance, if you're Apple or Facebook or Google, and then you have an investment portfolio, but it yeah. tends to be fairly small relative to your portfolio size. Whereas in Web3, you'll notice not just Animoca, but you know whether it's a Binance or an OKX or Coinbase, they're amongst the most prolific investors, yeah. broadly speaking. So they're both investors as well as operators. And what we operate in is mostly in the area of culture, entertainment, and you know, basically um, things that are sort of symbolic and cultural capital in nature as opposed to purely economic. Yeah. Obviously, we're also involved in tokens, but our emphasis is on culture entertainment versus, for instance, an exchange might be focused more specifically on basically the trading of fungible tokens. So slightly different areas, but still, I think, relevant to the growth of the ecosystem. Okay, that's great. So it's basically, yeah, and as I recall, you obviously started <coughs> within gaming, like Animoca mm -hmm. Brands was a gaming um, you know, incubator, right? And, and we actually developed and, and published, and developed games. And published yes. games. Okay, and so, but in breaking into the crypto space, right? For I recall, it was what came with crypto kitties yes, back correct. in the day. Exactly. The earliest NFTs, yes, 2017 exactly. time. Exactly. So, was that when you yourself first got into crypto, or did you first come across it in other ways? Beforehand? So, I came across crypto intellectually with Bitcoin in the early days, but really, I didn't have much. It was more like, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, but I actually would say the very first interesting, the very first uh, crypto I actually received was actually Doge. There was, basically, <laughs> there was basically a faucet. Okay. And, you know, basically yeah. you open up a wallet and, you know, back in the day, it was basically a kind of quasi airdrop or you could just go and collect tokens just for fun. Yeah. And I kind of sort of learned a little bit about that and opened up my first wallet and so on. It was kind of a little bit of a history, but it was never a lot. It was really just sort of curiosity. Yeah. But I think the moment where I really went all in in, in crypto was really CryptoKitties because the whole area about sort of NFTs as in the non-fungible nature for us was the culture side. Again, you know, we are not financial, a uh, financial company at its root, mm -hmm. right? So our interest was less around sort of what we viewed Bitcoin at the time as, you know, a store of value. Yeah. And many people in finance were really attracted to that concept. However, for people like us in gaming and culture and entertainment, it was a little bit alien to us. I mean, we understood the concept of it, but it wasn't something that sort of spoke to us in the same way. But when NFTs came, particularly with CryptoKitties, you know, our sort of, you know, emotions, feelings, imaginations all came alive in terms of, wait a second, you know, all those gaming items I used mm. to have, I could own that. And what could I do when I actually own them? And also what was really fascinating was that the supply wasn't actually governed by the company. It was actually governed by the people who were breeding cats. I mean, of course, it was a very primitive yeah. design, but it was really sort of elucidated some of these new models. And really what it was was a kind of open sourcing slash UGCing, if it was the right word for it, of the supply and demand aspect of basically a game economy that, you know, before that was tightly controlled. Mm. But then, of course, the biggest successful uh, sort of games in the world are all UGC, whether it's Roblox or Minecraft, that's number mm. one, number two biggest game in the world. And it's really basically users creating their own content and having a quasi stake in it. So that's actually what really got us into it. And then, you know, we found religion very quickly. We yeah. ended up basically um, 
the sort of ditching pretty much all of our traditional gaming business. Um, and of course, we recognized that in order to get into the space, we had to invest, which meant that we invested in, you know, <clears throat> back then, you know, Polygon and Decentraland and of course Dapper Labs. Uh, we acquired the Sandbox, right? All of those things that later on you would associate with NFTs and Metaverse, we sort of prolifically invested as a way to kind of play catch up a little bit to, you know, we were newcomers to the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't Bitcoin OGs, yeah. right? Uh, and, you know, as luck would have it, even though that was not part of the design, as you know, 2018 was very much basically a yeah. bearish, bearish yeah. time. You know, I think at one point Ethereum was like $90 and Bitcoin was like, I think, trading at $3,000 or $3, below, yeah, right? I mean, those, but that was 2018. And that's actually the year in where we really doubled down into the space. And so I guess as luck would have it, and luck is always an important factor, uh, we were fortunate both in getting into the NFT space because really there were only a few of us at the time, mm -hmm. and also getting into crypto in this space early when the market was really somewhat on its knees. And we didn't have the negativity of, you know, if we bought Bitcoin earlier, and then it would have had sort of a yeah. negative downward spiral, we might have been more negatively tinted towards it. Whereas yeah. we really kind of came in when the market was low. So from our perspective, it was like, Hey, seems there's only like one okay. way. there's only one way you can yeah, go. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and we didn't even look at it from that lens, right? Yeah. We made all of these investments, not thinking that they would become as big as they were. It was really more like, how do we learn about the space and how do we build the ecosystem so that we can partake in this, you know, from a much longer horizon. Right? Yeah. That's kind of, that's how we entered the space in 2018, 2019. Yeah, that's interesting. So obviously it was around this whole idea of like NFTs, which could give you your, your shared content around the games and everything within it the game. It was gaming items as a primary driver. That was a primary driver. Basically, initially from the game five component and investing in infrastructure that, you know, helped Correct. leverage. Exactly. So that's why we invested in a lot of sort of, you know, I guess L2 blockchains. Yeah. You know, obviously at the time, Matic yeah. before it became Matic Polygon. Polygon yeah. Was, uh, was one of the key ones, but we invested in a whole range of those, of those companies just to see that we could sort of, you know, not all of them worked out, but anyway, it was just a way for us to sort of learn about the space and, and sort of uh, accelerate that growth. Uh, but, you know, we, you know, one of the things that really took off in GameFi, you know, because it wasn't even called GameFi back then, yeah. right? We called it, I think, blockchain NFT gaming, games or blockchain, you know, blockchain games, games yeah. for instance, right? Was, uh, was, you know, basically a DeFi summer, yeah. right? And DeFi summer up until that came around in like 2020, we didn't really fully appreciate the potential of that. And then, you know, part of our education and part of our maturing in the space was to integrate much more financial elements into our business because we came to realize that, you know, Web3 is, and again, Web3 wasn't even a term back then, you know, Web3 is very financial in nature and the network effects construed in those networks aren't just utility-based, which is kind of what most gaming people think yeah. of, is actually very much tied to the financial network effects as well. And so we have to kind of be better at connecting them. And so I think all of those evolutions taught us more. And if we didn't invest as broadly as we did, because we invested in lending protocols, mm. DeFi protocols, you know, um, exchanges, that kind of stuff, if we weren't invested in them, then maybe this entire sort of uh, sort of uh, DeFi summer and other elements would have just passed us by because we wouldn't have had exposure to this. So I think investing was really the best form of education to sort of really sort of turbocharge us into the world of, of crypto and blockchain. Yeah, no, um, I remember that DeFi summer, the food, the food of farming. <laughs> yeah, exactly, everything yam was finance. Exactly, and all yeah, those, yeah, 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 finance, yeah, all those and, guys, and those yeah. cream and sushi, and cream, yeah, and like yeah, just yeah, everything, cheap. exactly. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is, is that they used elements of gamification, yeah. which we were familiar with, yeah. to make it more fun. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So the farming you know, component, the farming yeah, component, yeah, exactly. and the naming, and in fact, the more ridiculous and the more entertaining the name was the more participation you might get or the more effect you might have, yeah. which is kind of not that different from meme coins today. It's just really it's slightly a more intellectual, yeah, <laughs> slightly well, more high eyebrow in the, in, the, in the meme coin meta, but yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. but it's similar context. You need to farm, exactly, exactly yeah. Exactly. Um, so obviously then you were, you were focused on, and I'm curious if it's changed in terms of your investing mandate, like obviously then it was around the component of stuff that would leverage blockchain gaming as attention economy. Yes. But have you broadened that investing framework? So our investing uh, gaming, so we have 540 plus portfolio companies. Wow of which about 160 to 170 are in games. Yeah. So, which is of course the yeah. biggest single yeah. number, but then it's very distributed in everything okay. else. Yeah. Uh, with a heavy emphasis though on entertainment and culture or things that we think can facilitate that. So for instance, when we would be investing in NFT lending platforms, it was really to sort of bring more utilities to NFTs because we do believe that actually NFTs are going to be very, very valuable in the future. But independent of that, it was sort of building infrastructures to support that, which of course extended into other areas. And of course, lots of L1 and L2s, all these yeah. new protocols that we're involved in as well. Uh, not all of them EVM now, basically also move, you know, all these areas yeah. that we're investing in, just because we came to recognize that the space is much more diverse and also very innovative. Like for instance, one of our big bets last year was TON. Oh, right? yeah. and, and TON was one of those things where, 
you know, interesting enough, a lot of the people who were invested in Graham in the early days mm. got burnt. And yeah. we, we never had an opportunity to invest in that because we were just early in the stage. And then, you know, because of the whole settlement, actually, interesting enough, a whole bunch of them who were invested in that didn't partake in it because they had a little bit of quasi-PTSD from what yeah. happened. And then look at Ton today, right? Yeah, exactly. But again, the utility of why we invested in Ton wasn't because we thought the token would go up. I mean, that's obviously something you always hope for. But it's because we thought that as the... API gateway for the Telegram user yeah. to facilitate the growth of everything we invested in, right? So You've got a thousand, like close to a billion users already, right? Exactly, there. a billion yeah. users. And so if our portfolio and us as a group company can leverage those viral network effects, then how great would that be? Yeah. So therefore, it makes total sense for us to invest in that. And so we've had basically, so some of our portfolios like Gamey, for instance, uh, has registered up to 100 million users and has like three to four million daily actives just because of Telegram, right? Mm. So you can see how those network effects form really quickly. Yeah. And that's really why we would make these investments. So most of our investments come from that lens mm -hmm. that we think in various ways can add to the network that we're trying to build and facilitate in Web3. Um, not all of them work, obviously, yeah. and that's the nature of investing, but that's basically how we think of investing, broadly speaking. So it's much more than just gaming. Yeah, got it. And do you have like a specific framework, like a criteria in terms of the kind of project you invest in, potentially the size, uh, with how far so they no. are the funding? So, so size, no. We're very, we can be very early stage. We're all stages. We, um, we have now also recently announced that we're doing liquid token investing okay. as well. So meaning that we don't necessarily have to invest in a project that is seed or pre-seed. We think the market has changed. And that means that we should partake in opportunities where they are already maybe have a token in the market that we think has potential. Maybe they're undervalued and we can help them, for instance, that type of stuff, right? Especially given the fact that meme coins have completely diluted the attention. Yeah. It's important to basically back a few horses that we think make sense to help facilitate the growth of an ecosystem. So, so it's much more diverse than that. So, you know, and of course, when you start investing in live tokens, they could be worth billions of dollars. So yeah. that's definitely not early stage investing. But again, they leverage the network effects uh, in what we're trying to build. That's kind of the one lens. And of course, we want to build in systems that are open. Yeah. So we very much believe in this vision of a shared network, which means that, for instance, if you're building a closed blockchain or a very restrictive one, or you're thinking about it in more zero-sum sort of game ways, then we don't think it's ideal because it's very hard to build network effects on something that is closed, for instance, mm. um, which is also the reason why we might pass on certain gaming investments because there's a lot of um, sort of Web3 games that call themselves Web2.5. And you know, Web 2.5 to me is this funny thing because I'm like, is it are you Web 2.5 in a Web 2.4 way like, or Web 2.6 way? Like you're yeah. halfway, you get in there, you're trying to get used to it, you're trying yeah. to understand what Web 3 is. Yes, and yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh, and also, are you yeah. actually believing in decentralization, exactly. or are you actually really just saying it because yeah. you want to get money from people who are in the decentralized ecosystem because the ARPU is much higher in Web 3, yeah. right? So, so, so that's one of the reasons why we, for instance, don't invest in. Let's say, everyone's like, oh, you invest in all these games. We do. But there's a lot of them that don't believe in ethos from companies that could be very large, yeah. precisely because we think they're not building in the spirit of Web3, which is really important for us. Because we can't help a company if they build closed. Right? Yeah, we exactly. can't bring a community to it. Um, because essentially what we're doing is we're just building a walled garden and enabling something that's bad for the ecosystem and ultimately bad for us because we're so indexed to the ecosystem. So, so that's kind of, you know, some of the perspectives. Yeah, I completely agree. It's not just in game for like projects in general. They just like to throw on a tech on the blockchain meta or whatever just to potentially try and yes. tap a new investor class where they can't Absolutely. get through exactly. normal web two or normal. You don't need to go and become, you don't, if you don't need a token, if you don't need token economics, and if you don't need a community of that description, yes. then don't go and issue a token. Exactly. And I think a lot of people were just thinking, yeah, yeah, sell these NFTs. Yeah. But then actually, they came to realize whether it's a token or an NFT, actually what they just did was they actually created a liability for themselves. Exactly. Because, you know, you you create an expectation with the community. They own an asset of yours. It's and not... Gary's watching from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that aside, <laughs> that aside, you also have the issue yeah. of that the gaming community or the user that have acquired your token, which might not be the gamer, it could be yeah. a different type of user, has an expectation of something exactly. uh, that you can no longer fulfill. Or maybe you were never serious in fulfilling it, yeah. which is even worse, which mm -hmm. we've seen as well. Yeah. And that's not just true for gaming. It's true, broadly speaking. And I think this is the paradigm shift from a Web 2 user going to Web 3. If they don't appreciate that, mm -hmm. they fall into that trap uh, of thinking, I can just issue a token and then I can just go away. And actually, that doesn't work at all. And in fact, it's actually worse for you. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think people are getting smarter. But that certainly was an issue uh, you know, just a, just a few years ago. Yeah, right. So 
I'm just switching gears a bit. Obviously, you've talked about you are a VC in that sense. You know, yes, you invest, we do invest. You invest very you're a VC, exactly. And you talk a lot about the attention economy. You yes. invest in projects focused on the attention economy. And one of the things that's caught most of the attention of crypto these days is, of course, meme coins. Yes, right? of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm curious here, and I'm curious if you've been following the debate. I'm sure you've been following the debate around the whole meme coins versus sure. the VC <clears throat> coin. You know, the high float, low you know, circulation, low, sort of yeah. high, FTB, high valuation, low, high valuation, low, low, low floats float, kind of exactly, thing. Exactly. Um, which they and. It seems this PVP, like we, the you retail, we, we, the meme coins are on our side. You know, the VCs were the evil VCs dumping their coins on market. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I tend to think that there's, there's points on either side, right? You know, it's like, you know, in the sense that, yeah. you know, there are VCs and there are projects that have high valuations that are tanking them, that are coming to market sure. at unsustainable levels and all this kind of stuff. And it is being taken out yes. to retail. But also, you know, a lot of meme coins are loss making, right? And meme coins are not necessarily going to... I mean, be... isn't, uh, wasn't there a recent statistic that showed that I think something like only one or two or three yeah. percent actually make any money on meme yeah, coins? Like, like yeah, like $1,000 or more, right? And they're exactly. probably insiders as well, right? Exactly. So, um, exactly. so I'm I'm curious to get your take on it because you use it as an investing framework in terms of the attention economy, but also yes. you are an early stage investor. So yes. where do you, what do you think about that? So, I mean, there's so much to unpack here, but let yeah. me just firstly sort of talk kind of how we view meme coins, generally speaking. It is very much basically a form of attention economy. And I think of meme coins very similar to the early days of the internet when you look at chat rooms or like Reddit subgroups, mm -hmm. for instance. I mean, those are other ways to get attention. The only difference was you didn't have a way of financifying it, but it was still attention, right? Yeah. You know, and hey, I love cats, so let me put out a cat chat board. <laughs> and oh, I love brown cats, or I love these type of kittens, or I love these type of dogs. And, you know, some of them went big, and these chat rooms become, you know, something more than just what they started, and most of them fail and die. But, you know, no harm done, they just tried it. And this is kind of what we're seeing a little bit with tokens to me. You know, I think Pump.Fun alone was responsible for over 2 million token launches this year alone. Mm. But what's also interesting, and I think this is where the criticism comes, which is not the case, right? You know, the entire altcoin space increased by about 300 billion plus, give or take, since last year, right? So not, you know, as big as Bitcoin. But then why does it feel that the broad altcoin market is doing so poorly in relative sense? Well, that's because you're diluting the attention mm. of millions of new, let's call them products, right? Um, you know, basically network tokens. Um, and even though the space has grown, so in aggregate, there's more value and more money. Actually, the project that used to be really big three years ago wasn't, it wasn't as big as it is because in relative sense, it feels like, you know, oh, they're not flying to the same heights. But I would also argue that, you know, people say this about Axie Infinity or about SAND token, for instance, as well, right? And, but, you know, SAND token is still like a billion dollars. Yeah. And Axie Infinity is like billions of dollars. Like, where do we come off saying that that's actually a bad outcome? It was probably, yeah. it, it was just that there was concentrated attention three years ago because really when you wanted to invest in gaming, that's it. There wasn't yeah, anything yeah. else to invest in. And now you have hundreds of gaming projects and therefore you can sort of spread that around. I actually think that's a good thing because you need more value distribution going across the space so that people can broadly participate and invest in the same way that we're not just playing one game. You go to the app store, you don't see only five games to play. You actually want an investing framework where you can have much more diverse content come out. So I think it's broadly a positive thing. Now, having said that, I think you know, the, the sort, of, um, sort of high FTV, low float thing, I think misses the point entirely. I don't, there's no data. I mean, I think Hasib recently sort of, uh, sort of posted some research and basically they said it's inconclusive mm. that there's any difference between sort of, you know, um, sort of high FTV, low float or meme coin tokens being yeah. more successful. In fact, the numbers don't seem to indicate that you make more money this way. I think the difference between them is really to me, who are the teams building stuff behind them? The community is one element, but the other one, of course, is are they institutionally ready for stuff? So when you think about which tokens have done really well over the last six to 12 months in this sort of meme super cycle that we're seeing, it's actually the ones that tend to be institutionally backed. Ton is institutionally backed. Solana is institutionally backed. Ethereum is institutionally backed. Bitcoin is institutionally backed, meaning that they generally stood out in comparison to most other tokens that are out there, right? And by the way, I also think that it's possible once you've got much more lasting network effects within these tokens, that some of these meme coins could eventually also be held by institutions when they see the long-term effects coming from them, when they are truly decentralized. The majority of meme coins today are not actually really decentralized, right? They're just launching something yeah. and basically sort of playing the game. And you saw the recent thing about the SEC basically charging a whole bunch of uh, yeah, market you, manipulators. Yeah, market manipulators, right. market makers. Yeah, exactly, who are specifically yeah. actually playing that game. And I think we all know that it happens. Just wash trade. Right, exactly, yeah, exactly, and try to sort of create sort of the wrong type of attention. Yeah. Uh, so you see that. Now, what I also think, though, is that meme coins is somewhat also representative of the age we're in, which is there's deep inequality in the world, right? So, you know, one percentile, which I think a lot of people in, in crypto, fortunately, are in the upper percentile, but basically most of the world is not. 
And so when you're thinking, and, you know, and this is where the gambling speculative side comes in, it's like, well, hey, you know, I'm living in dire straits. What's my opportunity? This appears to be as fair as any. There's a better chance than a lottery ticket, so I'm going to go try these meme things, which are both fun, entertaining, but also have a chance of making money. So you see a whole cycle of that coming through as well. But then what happens is, is that, you know, when, you know, we're quite inspired by Bourdieu's forms of capital. So you have like the economic, you've got symbolic, you've got basically cultural and social capital, right? And I think of meme coins as being mostly economic capital with the social capital component in it, right? So if I own this token, I'm here for the money, but I'm also kind of here for the community, yeah. and there's a small amount of culture. But then once you start making money, and this is what you see in the real world, you know, there's a, there's a, how do I distinguish my status, my cultural symbolic status? It's not having more tokens. It's like in the real world, if you're a millionaire, good for you. Yeah. If you have two millions, good for you. But what's the difference between a single digit millionaire and a double digit millionaire? At that point, actually no distinction. So what do they do? They live in a certain area. They have a certain experience. Have they, a certain car, yeah, yeah, exactly. they have a nice car, or yeah. they've got this rare piece of art that only I can get, yeah. or you know, this musical instrument, whatever. They start to distinguish their cultural symbolic capital in ways that money alone can't buy. And that's actually why I think NFTs are going to be sort of, right now NFTs and meme coins are fighting for the same attention, which is, you know, by the way, NFTs are still a $10 billion industry, but it is now viewed in this sort of negative way because it hasn't got the same hype, shall we say. But actually what's happening, what I believe will happen is, is that when people start making money on meme coins and having a certain type of wealth, how do they essentially distinguish their social and cultural capital different from just having another meme coin, right? Because once there's a point of having too much of that, is, hey, I have this NFT. It could be a CryptoPunk, it could be a board Ape. And that's actually what we see in the real world, whether this is a Birken bag, or whether this is living in Beverly Hills, or whether this is having a certain kind of car artwork. This is kind of why I think, um, you know, NFTs actually are going to be mid to long term, the bigger, longer play, which is how we're investing and thinking about this. So meme coins is a kind of onboarding of that initial economic uh, sort of social capital. But really, when you think about what we're spending most of our time is actually on the cultural symbolic side. Like I go to college to prove mm -hmm. that I've done something for four years and I'm qualified. That, you know, if I go to a distinguished, a very, very famous college, that actually gives me capital, uh, a kind of social, cultural, symbolic capital that pure money can't buy. It's kind of like you could be a billionaire, mm -hmm. But I went to Harvard. You know, like yeah, exactly, that type exactly, of thing, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what NFTs represent. But they're all connected to each other. I think of NFTs and meme coins very much in the same ballpark, just with different levels of attention. Meme coin is stronger socially and economic. NFTs are stronger symbolic cultural. Fascinating. Yeah. So it's interesting because so what you're saying is that potentially all this wealth being created in the meme coin space, because people obviously they view it as financialism, we've got exactly. financialism, people are coming into meme coins that they want to create and become yes. part of the 1%, yes. right? And those people who are making it within the meme coin space potentially would want to, you know, pivot and rotate and invest in, in things that give them some sort of a digital identity. Or Correct, absolutely. That they can, you know, and show... Digital reputation. Digital reputation, yeah. Digital reputation. Digital reputation is absolutely core. And because that's also where they've made their fame, as it were, yeah. right? If you're a great trader or if you've made money in crypto, you want to demonstrate that you're that person. Now you own this NFT. You know, what's interesting about the NFT community is when they sell their NFT, they often have to excuse themselves to the community. They have to yeah. apologize. They're like, oh, my grandma is sick, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because it's a different kind of abandonment. It's like, oh, you know, like, um, like I'm, 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 I'm the, the, it's you're losing a part of your identity. Like, Whereas, it's gonna be selling a pet, like selling a pet, maybe you know, yeah, it's like a pet for, yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas when you if you sell your meme coins, yeah. you know, it's more good on you, and you've done, you've made because mm -hmm. the, because the proof of meme coins most of the time is not holding it, it's actually whether you've made money on it. But with an NFT, it's actually about holding it, mm -hmm. and that to me is why NFTs are more closely attached to reputation, because you know, once you've made it or you have a reputation to protect you actually spend money to defend it, yeah. right? So it's a completely different cycle. And I actually think this is what our industry needs long-term. But we're in this early cycle where essentially we're still mostly economic in nature and then we'll essentially evolve into that, which is also one of the reasons why we're so focused on reputation. We think that's actually going to be the trigger that makes the space much, much bigger. So coming back to the uh, concept of obviously these large VPC chains that mm. have tried to get the community involved, right? Yes. If they're not going with meme coins, they're trying to get in, make it more retail focused and try to get retail users because yes. obviously they want to have a community and mm -hmm. not just be viewed as Absolutely. a VC chain. Yes. So one of the things that's been a, a strong meta over, at least at the beginning of the year even so back, we talked about it, obviously, in the 2020 yes, exactly. summer is uh, the airdrops, right? Mm -hmm. Airdrops mm -hmm. to retail to Correct. incentivize users to use a network right. and, and hopefully and be find a part of the network. Be a part yes. of the network and users, hopefully, who are not yes. just, you know, civil farmers, right? right? But obviously, we've seen from the most recent 
past few really big yes. <laughs> projects that have gone through airdrop campaigns, it's fraught, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your view on that right now? How do you think a project you know, th goes about structuring an airdrop campaign that rewards users and the right kind of users without facing this massive you know, backlash that just you know, leads to FUD that dumps their token or just basically abandons the project entirely? One of the interesting things that, you know, just speaking uh, briefly about VC tokens, is that when an investor makes an investment early stage, actually it's not their token that can be sold on day one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Typically they're locked up for many yeah. years. And so actually, to me, that's actually not that different from whether you take a company IPO and the founders of the team are locked up for some period of because you want to give it the time to build the network so it establishes a certain value, a certain network effect or a certain infrastructure sort of scale and size that make, makes it worthwhile. So I think the lockup schedules are really important for people to understand when they see what's happening. And I think this is part of the problem about the meme coin narrative. First of all, there are some networks where it makes absolute sense to do community airdrops and let everyone partake, of course. But in some cases, it doesn't make sense because you know, projects still need money to build. You won't, you know, a game won't build by itself. Uh, you know, L1, L2 won't build by itself. There's infrastructure, there's people to hire. So there's costs involved. So the investors are a part of that bargain. And they're agreeing as part of that to take that early form of risk, but also to extend the risk over many years when the community through airdrops can get them early. And I think the biggest fault has been essentially basically all these civil attacks where, and we've had the same experience ourselves where, you a KYC AML a wallet, yeah. and then it's sold to some people in Russia or whatever, and they basically, you know, were not supposed to be able to get that, and then actually it's bots who are just farming tokens. Now, the way to solve that is reputation. And that's actually what we're trying to solve with Mochaverse by the ID system. And the way that we think about this is that, and by the way, every reputation system, we don't think it's exclusive to ours, will help to solve that. Because at the end, you would pay a bigger airdrop, we believe, to someone who has proven time and time again that he's been a good actor. And basically, if you're someone who just opened up a new wallet, you will get a very small, if any amount at all, because you are not going to give someone value to someone who's just a new entrant. That's actually not that different from whether it's, you know, a new employee in a company or whether it's a new person who sort of, you know, you know, became a citizen of a, of, 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 a, of a certain place. Like, again, they have to earn their trust and they have to earn their respect of the ecosystem, then good things will come to them. And that's actually what's not happening in Web3 because I think we ended up often confusing, and I think this is to the narrative of the yeah. Sybil attack guys, around, um, you know, anonymity and pseudonymity as the, oh, we need to be anonymous. Mm. Um, and therefore, you know, um, we can do business in this way. But imagine it in a, being in a society where every time you did business, you, it's a new person every time. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like, exactly, yeah. like, and actually, there can be no functioning country society that would work if you were dealing with someone that you couldn't have actual trust with. That doesn't work. But the basis of any government or any foundation of society is with trust, even with your own family networks, right? Imagine yeah. if you couldn't trust your own, exactly. your own family, it will break down, right? So how do you do that? Well, this is the beautiful thing about blockchain because with zero knowledge proofs, you can prove that you have a good reputation without actually having to reveal who you are. And this is also something you earn over time. So imagine that you've been a good person in the ecosystem building essentially you know, value in the networks, over many years, it will be natural for any other network to come to you and say, I'll pay you more, I'll give you more because you're a premium customer. It's not just about whether you dump the token or not. It's also about what you do and contribute. And we can then attest these a sort of a reputation onto it. And to me, this is the big unlock because in Web3, we have this funny problem, which is on one hand, we want to be inclusive. On the other hand, we need collateral. Mm, right? Yeah, yeah. right. So imagine, you know, I, 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 I sometimes give this example. Imagine if you're going to work for a company and you sort of feel you're deserving of a certain salary. The company says, sure, but you've got to put up a million dollar collateral first before I can hire you. <laughs> it's like, that's actually where we are in Web3 right yeah. now, right? Um, and think about the size of the unsecured credit market that we have today in, in the traditional world. But right? you can get a loan without actually having to put collateral um, because you have a reputation, because you have a certain job, or because score. Exactly, yeah. you have a credit score. Yeah. That's actually missing in Web3. And I think once we build a sort of a proper sort of credit system that is anonymous in nature, but one that you can prove across multiple forms of attestation, which by the way, I think isn't just financial. It comes from game companies, L1, L2 blockchains, they all can essentially attest value into an ID system. Then you have, I think we will solve these Sybil problems because Sybil only works when you do it for the first time and when you do it uh, on an anonymous basis without having the mm. reputation to protect. Because once you do a civil attack, your reputation is destroyed and yeah. whatever wallet you use for that purpose basically gets thrown away, right? 
Um, and I think essentially that's what I the, that's what we need to build. And and the reputation system I think will create a much richer ecosystem as a result. Yeah, I mean, MoCAD, just come back to this technically because I'm really fascinated by this. So obviously, it's this is it similar to the concept of the soulbound NFT? It's a soulbound NFT okay. that basically is a uh, DID. Yeah. And you would, um, so someone would obviously attach their real world IRL identity to their blockchain identity. They can, but it wouldn't be exposed to the world, right? And then how would you prevent someone, for instance, being able to sell access to, like they would sell accounts on exchange, KYC accounts. Like how would if someone want to sell their, their IRL, their blockchain identity to someone else to farm, right? So the point is that even if you were to sell it, which is not something you can ultimately, um, I mean, someone, you know, by the way, this is sort of slightly philosophical, but you know yeah. how some people, some royal families, you know, in order for have a knighthood, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. literally sell yeah. title deeds, yeah, right? Yeah, so they yeah. can be sort of sir something yeah. or baron something, right? So you can, so to me, niche as it may be, it's your right to do so if you wanted to sell yeah. something. The point is that if you sold it, you're also selling with it whatever accrued reputation you've built, right? So in other words, let's say I spent two years building value in this ID and now it gets great airdrops as an example. Then if I sold it to someone, that's your asset to sell. If the other person decides to then destroy it, destroy yeah. it, that's up to him, right? It's like, if I'm going to go and build a restaurant, I build a house, I have a great restaurant, and I sell it for a lot of money because it makes a lot of revenue, and then this guy basically does some rubbish with it and destroys reputation or, 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 or brings in cheap food, like he just, yeah. right? Or a bad booze or something. Just sell your credit score, basically, or sell basically. your credit online. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so you you make a you make yeah. a quick profit, yeah. and then everything goes away. Actually, your long term investment goes away. And, yeah. and this is the interesting. The longer you invest in something, whether this is an asset or a reputation, actually, the more valuable it becomes. Yeah, that's true. Right. So, if I sell you something I just created, it's worth nothing anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, to me, that's a defense. Right. The defense is, I will only give it to you because it's worth what I made put in input. And if I give you a wallet I opened two years ago with an ID that was created two years ago, but it's done nothing, yeah. that's also not worth anything because yeah. it has no reputation at all. Again, I think I think there are natural human aspects that will I think solve for this this um, sort of this uh, dichotomy. Yeah. So essentially, the, the concept where um, yeah, you can your digital your um, when you create your wallet and your, your unique identity, obviously, or I, you can build up the value. There's a, no right. need for collateral, like. Basically, and it gets a stage where projects won't need the collateral. Basically, just yes. you know, you've built up this reputation, which in itself takes a lot. It's a lot more time and energy and effort to create Correct. an ID than just to have collateral to throw around in the mean, protocol. The and all these collateral just follows protocol to protocol. Like exactly, that. and that's the whole point about being cross-chain. Because yeah. this is the other thing about sort of when you think about people launching new blockchains, is that you are allowed to start your reputation from scratch. Yeah. Which I understand, but it's kind of like saying. Hey, I did something bad in Dubai. Let's yeah, start exactly, over in Singapore, exactly. just like that, right? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, that doesn't work, right? Because then basically you just let criminals fly all over the place because they basically can do civil attacks everywhere a hundred times, which is basically what's happening right now. Whereas if we had a way in which we could track that identity, um, not knowing his name, but just knowing whether he or she was a good actor, we could then basically say, okay, you de you're deserving this or you're not. And I think again, you know, for Animoca, we are in a somewhat unique position to do this because our 540 portfolio companies using Mocha ID will mm -hmm. attest their reputation to that user. Yeah. And so this actually becomes really interesting because now when the ID is out, they don't even have to talk to us about using it. Yeah. Anyone can just be freely using the ID system to say, I want those users because they've been attested by this game, this blockchain, whatever, to say he's a good user. I'm more happy to do that. This inspiration came a little bit from our interaction with NFTs because that's actually what NFTs were. If you're a board ape holder, you had a certain value. And if I could tell that you never sold your board ape, you were probably better yeah, yeah. than the person who traded it, right? So the small elements of that, but they're not perfect because it's only one ecosystem, but that was actually the inspiration. Great, so let's just take a bit of a step back now. Obviously, sure. we've talked about a lot of different sectors. <clears throat> Obviously, you in cross assets and cross ecosystem as well. Yes. Um, and I want to look more broadly at the crypto market yeah. in general in terms of a lot of these different narratives that have emerged, right? <clears throat> when people say you've got to invest first based on narratives because narratives is where intention usually goes and focus on particular narratives, they drive where the capital flows. Which narratives are you particularly interested in right now as, at Animoca, focused on? Obviously, game is one we know, um, and, but are there any others? And yes. then, you know, in any particular projects that you just want to highlight, do you think this is a really exciting <laughs> building within yes. this ecosystem? So first, uh, when we talk about sort of um, narratives, I agree with you that obviously, I think narratives drives everything in human society because we are narrative creatures, right? I think uh, I forgot who coined the term, but they were saying that, you know, you know we are actually homo narans, as in, you know, as, as a species, we yeah. live only on stories, right? Yeah, yeah. And in that sense, money is a story, politics is a story, government is a story. We just agree more broadly that that is the story we want to follow and therefore become something of power. I mean, religion, all these things basically are formed in similar ways. 
Now, when it comes to narratives, though, uh, we're much more interested in the long-term narratives that we believe in because we think we can make an impact. This is maybe different when you're thinking about sort of which cycle you want to. If you're a trader, actually, you might not get the best advice from yeah. us because we're not momentum traders in that yeah. way because that's not how we, how we, how we play in the space. We're much more interested in something that we believe we can have an impact and influence in. And my own personal investing style, and also I think the way that we like to explain it to people is, if you have conviction in something, then it's much easier to invest in this because you have a belief in this. And you can also not just advocate for it, but you can also sort of, even if it doesn't go as well as you'd like it to, at least, you know, you have an appreciation for that, right? It's kind of like, you know, you know, some people invest in wine because they like to drink wine. Yeah. But some people invest in wine because they think the value goes up. And if you invest in wine because you also appreciate it as a, as a user, then at the end of the day, it's not just a backup. It's just more like you appreciate the process and you actually long term on it. So meaning that over 10 years is probably fine, but maybe in the next six to 12 months, you know, the pricing of that might yeah. not be. And I think this is the point about meme coins as well and general tokens is that if you're trying to time the market, then good luck. Like literally, yeah. I think you're yeah. gambling, yeah. but that's okay if it's what you want to do. But then if it's a narrative you believe in and you appreciate, for instance, if you're a gamer, the reason why we like GameFi so much, and most of the world's gamers aren't in GameFi yet, but why the reason we like that is because we think the relationship of bringing a gamer over into basically the world of Web3, therefore improving their financial literacy, is much higher because they already have an affinity towards it. One of the reasons why I think the world has such low financial literacy is because most of the world actually isn't really interested in money. Yeah. Now, let me, I don't mean that people don't want money. Sure, people want money. But the interest about investing and understanding how money works is actually something that's really reserved only for the one or two percentile in the world. And they tend to be in Wall Street or maybe in crypto. And they tend to also do better because they understand that world well. Most other people, like my mom is a musician and she's an artist, a wonderful artist, you know. However, she never cared about money. She had no idea what it was and actually she didn't really want to know what it was all about, right? And if we had to tell her, hey, in order for you to be financially successful in your industry, you need to also understand how to negotiate contracts and have financial literacy, she would have done so very reluctantly because it's just not her interest, right? What I love about sort of, you know, um, uh, tokens um, is that you can actually now introduce financial elements and therefore financial literacy into everything that's out mm. there, right? It's not just about, is it a stock or a share or a property? It could be a gaming item. It could be something mu musical. It could be something just fun. It could be anything in the world. Like for instance, we have teachers who are making money basically uh, creating their educational content as NFTs that then give them the royalties of that content. And they might only make 10 or $20 a year, but now they can sell it for $50 or $100 because it becomes a capital asset. And suddenly that teacher is like, oh wait, my teaching content is an asset. Yeah. That's intellectual property. What's intellectual property, right? So that to me is actually what I really love about the space. So then there's for speaking of narratives that are long-term, right? Outside of gaming, for instance, very big on reputation, right? Obviously, Mochaverse yeah. is the big shout out here because we think Mo uh, the reputation, and by the way, we've invested in other DID systems, so it's not just Mochaverse. The whole point is that we think reputation is going to be the big unlock because think about how much we already are uh, sort of spending in the reputation market in the real world, right? You know, all the unsecured credit we're giving, mm -hmm. all, the, all, the, all the employment we're giving, all these things are probably trillions of dollars of market that are completely unlocked, sort of, un sort of, um, uh, not available in Web3, reputation will unlock. So we think that's a big one. But is it going to happen next three months? No, right? Because reputation takes time to build, right? It's a building block. But I think that unlock will basically make our space even bigger. So that's kind of one big area. The other area I like a lot is education. Again, education is one of those narratives that, you know, is not super sexy, but it's a $5 trillion space, right? And for me, it's also partially a little bit in terms of how do we bring people into the space that like, um, that can understand the space better. So for instance, if you say teachers, you know, for instance, what we're trying to solve in, in with, 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 uh, with Open Campus, for instance, is if teachers make more money with NFTs, then that's actually a good thing for teachers. Um, and who can criticize that, right? Yeah. Or, for instance, we can solve student loans, basically getting better student loans. For instance, imagine if a student receives their student loan financing at a better rate through crypto. That kid is there for life. Right, yeah. right. So stuff, stuff like that is the narratives that really drive. But of course, you know, we're also into deep in because again, that's infrastructure as well. Um, we're of course investing in continued sort of scaling infrastructure as well. You know, like with Aptos, for instance. Of course, Ton for distribution. So it's very wide. But if I had to sort of pinpoint two longer term trends that we like, uh, definitely we like we love education, we love reputation. But it's not going to be a super cycle next quarter. Yeah. Right, just to be clear. It's yeah. so a very long term focus investor. <laughs> I mean, when we yeah. invested in gaming in 2017, yeah. 2018, it wasn't even a term. In fact, yeah. I re remember we were fighting with not 
people from the traditional gaming space. They were like, oh, that's weird, right? Yeah. It was actually people within the crypto community, yeah. right? People were hating on NFTs. That's right? interesting. Right? Crypto, crypto natives were hating on NFTs in 2018. Yes, you know? I mean, I, I remember having big arguments with people uh, on, on, on crypto Twitter when you know, I had a much smaller following around things like, well, I can just copy paste, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so, sort of, you know, basically, um, but really what it was was, remember, 2018 was yeah. a super bear market. Yeah, yeah. And really the fear was you're drawing away attention from what needs to happen here. Which is one of the reasons why I think people are hating on meme coins. The silly crypto cat is taken away. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But actually, I think it, it actually is a net positive. But of course, we have to deal with all of the other problems that yeah. the space has. Yeah, so I mean, okay, so deepen, gamify, long-term reputation yes. and education. Um, but so GameFi, obviously, that's one that you see also quite focused on. Oh, mostly yeah. portfolio companies. Because, it's, it's yeah. because, because they're onboarding all these users. I mean, exactly. Gamey, which has now three to four million DAU, it's a game company launching 80 different sort of casual games on Ton, yeah. right? And to me, there, it's not just because I like gaming um, and because 3.4 billion people in the world play games today. Gaming has been the catalyst of our digital economies. You know, it's because of gaming we have NVIDIA. Mm, and awesome. because, you know, the reason why we're buying these crazy graphic cards and boosting NVIDIA and back then AMD as well is because we want to play games with better resolution. It has nothing to do with the... Um, you know, like like you know, GPU mining or efficiency out of AI that came much later. In fact, it was the sort of whimsical, fun things that drove the innovation, made Nvidia what it is today. Then laid the foundation for essentially having things like Bitcoin mining and eventually powering all of AI. That happened with gaming first. There you go, guys. You heard it here first. World of Warcraft helped with the AI rev revolution. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no. Yeah, and, yeah. and many of the inspirations. I mean, even Vitalik has his sort of yeah, sort of you know, centralization decentralization yeah. story because of Warcraft. Even if it's somewhat of a fable, although I think he did say that, yeah. it's still something that inspires us at the time. And and I think gaming is the real thing that um, is the virtual thing that um, that affected the physical world in massive ways. Mm -hmm. There's really. You know, it's the, really, it's the, you know, if there's a, you know, you talk about real world assets, well, this is digital world assets, right? This DWA going in reverse mm -hmm. because the reason of gaming, so sort of the reason uh, gaming created GPUs, curved screens, yeah. PlayStation, yeah. Xbox, like, you know, industry larger than music and, and, and movies combined came from a virtual thing first, which was gaming. I mean, so obviously GameFi, even, um, obviously there's the, the points you raised now around Toncoin and that ecosystem, yes. the mini game apps, which has seen this explosion in growth, right? Yes. Um, one GameFi sector, which I, well, not sector, but part of it, which I think yes. is lacking or struggling, is, yes. you know, for instance, uh, the hardcore native gamers, right? Sure. And I remember, I'm sure you recall back in the 2021 yes. cycle, gamers was incredibly averse, like an adverse reaction to anything NFT. In the West. Think, in the West. In the West, not okay. in the East. But let me, let me sort of unpack that a little bit. One of the reasons why many GameFi projects haven't done well is because they actually aren't building true network effects. So remember, when you think about a token framework, we think of it as a network effect. And launching a token is essentially expanding and broadening your network to more users. But some people build very bad network effects. So most games, and frankly, many of the ton games are still at this stage, but they have the opportunity to build something more multidimensional, is a one-way network effect. I build a game and you interact with the game. For instance, if it's a single-player game, yeah. then you're building a viral network, but you're not building a network effect, right? Those are two different things. So we shouldn't conflate millions of users with actually a real network, right? So because the interaction is, you know, one to many, but it's not many to many. What you want is many to many. So the biggest games in the world, Roblox, Minecraft, they're many to many. And when you have multiplayer games, they have certain elements that allow that. That's why multiplayer games do much better than single player games mm -hmm. financially. Because again, they build these network effects. So when you think of a gaming project, for instance, for instance, or any token infrastructure that you are looking to invest in, I think you need to try to analyze where do the network effects come from. And if the network effects come really just because there's a fire hose from, let's say, let's call it Telegram, that's a good bootstrap. But then what happens when the person is in the game? Is he staying there? Is he making friends? One of the reasons why social networks work so well, at least the ones that are in Web2, is because you create bonds and friendships, mm -hmm. and these actually become networks that are really hard to break, and therefore you have very strong network effects. So that, I think that's kind of really important that you, and, and by the way, this is how I think about L1, L2s as well, right? If you have a whole network that was just farmed by bots, this network is goodbye, yeah. right? But if you basically um, um, sort of are able to build real developers and ecosystems, the reason why you know, I'm, I'm still super bullish on Ethereum, for instance, is because they've got the most developers on it, and they've got most TVL, they've got all these things that are helping build that, network effect native that people draw them to it intrinsically, mm. not just because there's a short-term incentive, right? Um, so that's kind of um, how, we, how we think about the, about the space broadly. And, and so when we think about sort of, um, sort of uh, gaming projects, right? Um, 
Telegram allows you for the distribution. But again, focus very much on sort of where those network effects um, come from. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, so obviously, uh, now obviously your perspective is long term. We've established that, which is great. But I'm curious. Obviously, you will have to have your pulse on the market, right? Because you know, obviously, we try to anyway. You know, you have to. I mean, it's hard, but <laughs> it's yes. hard. Like you know, it's like there's so many factors now. Increasingly, yes. seems to be coming what's happening at you know, the Fed and the macro factors. That That's all true too. Yes. yes, all crypto analysts have turned into the, you know the macro analyst, the yes. um, armchair macro analyst. But I'm curious then to get your perspective then around everyone's talking about this fabled altcoin season, which is obviously important for all of us in crypto um, when retail demand comes flooding back into the market. Um, when do you think we're going to, do you think we're going to see that anytime soon? When do you think we're going to see it? Um, and what factors should we, should we be looking at to potentially be a catalyst for that? The altcoin season is already here from our perspective because the markets grew up bigger than it was a year ago. The only thing is that we're not necessarily seeing the same type of success per project. Like we're basically, but it's not realistic to think that millions of tokens are going to launch and millions of tokens are going to 100x. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah, where, where, like, where does the math come up from yeah. here, right? You know, I think we, um, I mean, I've written up about this. Um, my view on this is that you've got to start looking at projects that also have institutional backing if you want something that's more long-term. And the reason why I think the institutional backing is so important when you want to focus on, let's say, an altcoin um, is because institutions have the ability to be long-term about something. They have a thesis. They talk about that. And they can basically take a three to five-year horizon whether it's on market or whether it's um, sort of, you know, basically VC back, doesn't really matter. And the reason why, therefore, I go back to this VC back topic, why it's important is because if it's VC back, then it has lots of funding behind it. Then actually, it's not at risk of essentially not being able to fulfill its project potential. Also, it's accountable to someone. Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, for instance, if you look at what happened with Frentech, right? I mean, what the hell yeah. was that, right? I mean, seriously, right? Yeah. I mean, no accountability whatsoever. This is bad for the space, right? So again, when you have actually a backing from VCs, the role isn't, again, the right VCs. It's not just, hey, they, have, they bought tokens. They actually have a role. It's not yeah. just strategic support. They also keep you accountable. They also make sure that, you know, if you basically rug on an investor that's, uh, that's, that's uh, well known, mm. guess what? The chances of you having another project very, very small, for instance, yeah. right? Like all these things matter. So I think we, and, and the problem is that the attention span is just so small because if I have hundreds of tokens to look at, right, or even thousands of tokens to look at, how do I know? Then I just look at the sound bites. Then I think really you need to look at basically the institutional backing as a way to say, okay, if this guy's involved, then what research has he put out? Can I analyze it? Because we all say DYOR, but in reality, do your own research still doesn't apply because people don't have the attention span. Um, and, you know, they don't have the, let's call it the literacy or the maturity to basically think about this long term. And therefore, um, they, you know, what are the signals for you to look at? So first, I do think altcoin season will come back because I think Web3 is growing broadly. But I don't think it's going to be like every token is going to do well the same way. Yeah. I think aggregate value will go up, but there will be them, those that are standout. And I think the standout factor will come from more so than less the ones that have institutional backing. It doesn't matter whether it's VC or not. To me, that's an added point, but it's not actually the most relevant point, right? For instance, you know, if you're if uh, if you have a certain token that is a big community construct, um, could be Shape, could be Doge, for yeah. instance. I completely see a potential where institutional backers might say, you know what, we can back this token because it now has a real community and a real network and real people building on it. It doesn't matter that there's an institution behind it or not, right? So that's possible. It's just maybe not going to happen very soon, but I think that's possible. Okay. So in summary, you're going to have an altcoin season, but it's going to be an altcoin tide that's not going to lift all altcoin boats. It's basically going to be I think it's going to list the entire market. But, but, but yes. not... But, but... Well, okay, so let me uh, let me correct that also. Some maybe. will do better than others. Correct. Because but some will also like definitely not do well, right? Like, well, yeah. but that to me is like anything in life, yeah. right? You know, when you when you when you know, remember, people sometimes forget. Do you know how many NFT projects launched in 21, 22 that basically didn't do well, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, that's kind of the same thing, yeah. right? So there was a few standouts that continued to hold up and do well, and the vast majority of them basically um, they weren't worth much. That's that's the same thing with meme coins. Okay, so I mean, obviously, um, it's, we're running we're running quick on time. Yeah, I just wanted to get to a few of your predictions, right? <laughs> this is Coin Bureau. This is Crypto YouTube. Of course, we, you know we love our predictions. Of course, right? so, yes, yes. Okay. And I'd just love to get your perspective on a few of the hottest topics out there in Please. crypto right now. Yes. So, um, U.S. election mm. is in a month or so. Obviously, yes. I know you've, we've talked about when the stage, I know we did one stage Quinta, exactly. and you said it's not really the, the figureheads, it's what the, you know, the actual house and everything exactly. determines the regula legislation. Yes, but who do you think is going to win? I think Kamala's going to win. Kamala's going to yes. win. And the reason why, by the way, I know in crypto it's not a popular opinion. And I also completely appreciate that, of course, if Trump wins, it's going to be definitely parabolic for our industry, yeah. I think. 
It's because um, you know, it's I think it's a Taylor Swift vote. Okay. You know, um, I, I, Swifties, they're, I, they're Swifties. powerful. <laughs> well, you know, one of the biggest challenges you have with uh, with election is registration. Yeah. And true. and um, and when the youth typically when the youth votes, the Democrats tend to win. Right. In fact, I think historically it's always been the case, uh, at least you know within our living memory. So that means that um, that means actually. Um, you know, um, her activating her vote voter base, and we know the margins are very, very small. Is that if the youth decides because you know um, the, the Swifties basically uh, Taylor got people to go there, then I think that'll tip it. I think I mean you know if and if there's any any celebrity in the world that could do that, it would be her. Yes. Yes, the the answer. Yes. Is Taylor Swift runs the world. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly in the yeah, Midwest of yeah, America, which yeah. is actually where a lot exactly. of the votes are. Will we ever see a meme coin ETF? Ooh, yes, I think we will. Okay. Um, but I think for the meme coin to actually become an ETF, it needs to really test sort of this sort of full decentralization element, which I think in time it'll happen. Yeah. I don't think we'll see it any time in, in, in the near term. But I think in the mid to long term, it's entirely possible. Not even a Dogecoin ETF, no? Um, it's decentralized enough? I mean, no? it's decentralized enough, but I think the regulators need to be comfortable with this one. But I do but I do believe a meme coin ETF is absolutely in the car. Uh, third one. Uh, this time next year, and this is the, the big one, <laughs> where do you think we see Bitcoin trading? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, I mean, I think it'd be great if Bitcoin was trading somewhere between you know, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars. But you know, my I gave a prediction earlier in the year saying that I think Bitcoin will hit a hundred thousand. Depending what happens in the election, who knows, right? Um, a few months ago, you know, still, man, still yeah. months ago, and depends on wins in the election. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, if I was going to be a little bit more conservative, one hundred fifty, you know, one hundred fifty-ish yeah. range, I think makes sense. You know, I'm a big believer that long-term Bitcoin is going to be a million plus because I think of Bitcoin as a status asset, right? Basically, but but you know, you know, when you talk about just one year from now, again, as I said, we're not super great at timing the market. But uh, yeah, let's call it 150. Another one, another contentious one. <laughs> Will Seoul flip ETH in terms of market cap? Not anytime soon. Not anytime soon. And also, I think a lot will depend on whether Seoul can maintain the meme coin super cycle. So ETH retained, got a lot of its value, by the way, because remember, NFTs were essentially the memetic of Ethereum back in 21, 22, right? And remember, 99% of all NFT trading only happened on Ethereum. That's actually what created yeah. that value. But it still had a certain base level because of the institutional backing. Solana has institutional backing too. In order for Solana to really flip Ethereum, we have to make some assumptions. And the assumption is that meme coins, at least in the near term, are going to be not just growing faster than they are right now, which is of course possible as a platform, but will also create more value, which is hard because you need to assume that people onboard onto Solana faster mm -hmm. than they go onboard onto other blockchains, which I don't think will necessarily be the case. So I do believe in the long-term growth in Solana. I'm a holder as well. Yeah. Um, but I'm not, um, I don't believe it'll flip um, Ethereum anytime soon. And I think much will have to change for it to truly flip Ethereum as an ecosystem. Do you think Ethereum has a stronger network effect than Solana? I think it absolutely okay. does. Just look at the TVL. The financial aspect of it is just much greater. The developer ecosystem is, you know, if you're building on Ethereum today, it's about reputation. Mm. If you're building a Solana, you're probably building a meme coin. Again, this will evolve over time. Remember, in the ICO days, of you know basically uh, 2017 or 2016 yeah. even, right? A lot of them basically were literally just doing their version of a quasi meme coin on Ethereum. Yeah. So how long did it take for the ICO days for Ethereum to mature to where it is today? About six seven years. I think Solana will be similar. Fascinating man. Um, so thanks again, Yat. This has been an amazing uh, opportunity to speak with you. Like I say, a veritable font of knowledge on all things crypto and beyond. And, um, you know, I think that um, there's a lot of stuff we learned from you today and it'd be amazing to, once you're back into power or even virtually to have you on again and just share your wisdom with our viewers because I think the way you view the crypto industry is the way I think everyone should be doing it. Like the longer term perspective, looking at what it's doing for society mm. and all of us, and not just this perspective of this financial nihilistic point around making as much money as possible as quickly as we can or hopping onto the next meme coin, onto the next narrative. So thank you for bringing this perspective to our viewers and uh, we'd like to have you on again soon. Thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Pleasure, man.